The Four Biggest Mysteries in the Bible Number 1. Before the Flood What was the world like before the flood? How was life before the flood? In the book of Genesis, the early chapters describe a world that existed before the Great Flood, which was vastly different from our own. In the early chapters of the Bible, particularly in the book of Genesis, we come across a world very different from our own, a world before the Great Flood. The First Murder – Cain and Abel After Cain murdered Abel, sin grew immensely. After God punished Cain, he went to live in the land of Nod, which is east of Eden. In the land of Nod, Cain constructed a city named after his son Enoch. Enoch's descendants included notable figures of their time. Unfortunately, Cain's murderous ways were passed down through his family line. We find a man bragging about his violence when we get to his great-great-great-grandson. After only four chapters of God's perfect design, people are already engaging in bloodshed and defying his plan for marriage. In contrast to Cain's lineage, God established a new family tree by giving Eve a son named Seth in place of Abel. Like his deceased brother, Seth exemplified the same kind of worship, and people began to invoke the Lord's name in connection with him. The Generations After Adam The world became populated, but it also became filled with sin. People were not kind to each other. They lied, stole, and even killed. During that time, people lived exceptionally long lives, often surpassing a century. It was a different era when humanity was more closely connected to its origins and the world was younger. As Adam and Eve's children grew up, they took wives and started their own families. Over time, the population started increasing steadily. Seth, one of Adam's sons, also had descendants like Enoch, Methuselah, and eventually Noah. This line of people was notable. They carried the seed of humanity's first union with fallen angels. But despite their long lives and profound wisdom, these early people were not immune to the problems that often plague humanity. Issues like jealousy, anger, and sometimes even violence. Genesis chapter 5 gives us the first impression of Enoch. There is a first Enoch that was the son of Cain. This is a different Enoch. Enoch's case was the first rapture recorded, as God simply took him. Before the first flood, the world experienced the first rapture. Musicians also made their appearance. Jubal, another descendant of Cain, was the father of all those who play the harp and flute. Genesis 4.21 These roles allowed society to become more complex and organized, setting the stage for more advanced forms of civilization. In a nutshell, before the flood, humanity expanded and diversified. Families turned into tribes roles turned into professions, and civilization took its first steps. Invasion of the Nephilim As the self-appointed commander of the Kingdom of Darkness, Satan summoned his evil legions to infiltrate humanity, to pollute the Edemic line leading to the Messiah. Genesis chapter 6 verses 1 and 2 When human beings began to increase in number on the earth, and daughters were born to them, the sons of God saw that the daughters of humans were beautiful, and they married any of them they chose. These fallen angels descended on earth and gave birth to the Nephilim, or giants. The Hebrew word for Nephilim translates as fallen. This satanic invasion of Genesis 6 corrupted the entire world. The sons of God saw the daughters of men. It is more accurate to see the sons of God as either demons, angels in rebellion against God, or uniquely demon-possessed men, and the daughters of men as human women. The Wickedness of Mankind In the early chapters of Genesis, specifically in Genesis chapter 6, verses 1 through 5, the Bible paints a picture of the world before the flood. The earth was not a place of peace or kindness, but one filled with sin, violence, and moral corruption. Imagine a world where people are consumed by their desires, always seeking to do whatever they want, regardless of the cost to others. Honesty, integrity, and kindness are not celebrated or even understood virtues. Instead, deceit and manipulation rule the day. Everyone is out for themselves, 
and the very fabric of society is torn apart by selfishness and wickedness. In such an environment, families are not sanctuaries of love and support, but battlefields of deceit and betrayal. Neighbors don't look out for each other. They look to exploit one another. Governments are not institutions of justice, but rather systems of oppression, upholding the rule of the powerful over the weak. Now, insert into this chaotic world an unusual development, the Nephilim. The Nephilim were unique and different from regular people. They were strong and larger than life, but they made the world's problems even worse. They were admired, feared, and perhaps even worshipped, pulling people further away from the true god who had created them. Their might made them objects of fascination, but they were a part of a world spiraling further into chaos and sin. It was in this context that God saw the wickedness of mankind. Spiritual and Moral Decline Humanity, the crown jewel of creation, had lost its way. Rather than living in harmony with each other and the world, people were consumed by violence, wickedness, and deceit. God looked down upon his creation and felt an immense sorrow. The Bible says, So the Lord was sorry that he had made mankind on the earth, and he was grieved in his heart. Genesis chapter 6, verse 6. It was a divine grief, a deep sorrow that transcended human understanding. Imagine a parent, heartbroken over the actions of a wayward child, yet infinitely magnified. And so, in his great pain, God made a difficult decision. God was upset by the actions of the people he made and was left with no other option to heal a world spiraling into chaos. So, to know the world before the flood is to know the world during Noah's time. What was the time of Noah like? Luke chapter 17, verses 26 through 30. And as it was in the days of Noah, so it will be also in the days of the Son of Man. They ate, they drank, they married wives, they were given in marriage, until the day that Noah entered the ark, and the flood came and destroyed them all. Likewise, as it was also in the days of Lot, they ate, they drank, they bought, they sold, they planted, they built. But on the day that Lot went out of Sodom, it rained fire and brimstone from heaven and destroyed them all. Even so will it be in the day when the Son of Man is revealed. Jesus used this time to explain that the world was carrying on with their daily activities, like eating, drinking, and getting married. Everyone just carried on with their life. Conditions before the flood and before the judgment of Sodom and Gomorrah were terrible, but the wickedness was accepted as usual and routine. There is nothing intrinsically sinful about any of those activities. So what was the problem? The problem was they were so immersed in those activities, they did not recognize the days in which they were living. I would sum that problem up in one word, materialism. They were so immersed in the material, they no longer had any understanding or alertness for the spiritual and the eternal. Number two, the truth about Jacob's ladder. Jesus explained the truth about Jacob's ladder. The story of Jacob's ladder has fascinated people for many years. The expression Jacob's ladder has developed into a common phrase. It has been used as the title of a movie, a book, a flower, and even as the name of an electronic device. But where did this phrase come from in the first place? In Genesis 2, the phrase Jacob's ladder is mentioned. Jacob, the future father of the nation of Israel, was on the run from his twin brother Esau. Jacob decided to camp out under the stars alone and on the run, with nothing but a rock for a cushion. At this point in Jacob's life, his heart is probably filled with regret for the past, loneliness in the present, and uncertainty about the future. But then, the story takes a momentous turn. Genesis chapter 28, verses 11 and 12. And he happened upon a particular place and spent the night there, because the sun had set. And he took one of the stones of the place and made it a support for his head, and lay down in that place. And he had a dream. And behold, a ladder was set up on the earth with its top reaching to heaven. And behold, the angels of God were ascending and descending on it. 
This is Jacob's first supernatural encounter with God, and it parallels Abraham's in Genesis 15. It's also worth noting that Jacob is nearly the same age as Abraham was when God told him to leave his home and travel to a new land. When Jacob awoke from his sleep, he knew exactly what had happened. He concluded, Surely the Lord is in this place, and I did not know it. In his encounter with Nathanael, the Lord Jesus made an apparent reference to this incident. John chapter 1, verses 49 through 51. Nathanael answered him, Rabbi, you are the Son of God, you are the King of Israel. Jesus answered him and said to him, Because I said to you that I saw you under the fig tree, do you believe? You will see greater things than these. And he said to him, Truly, truly, I say to you, you will see heaven opened and the angels of God ascending and descending on the Son of Man. The latter illustrates the relationship between God and man. It shows that the God who created the universe wishes for a close relationship with his creation, particularly humanity, and that he is the one who initiates that connection, discussion, and friendship. As Jacob's ladder illustrated, the connection between God and men, Jesus Christ, is the spiritual connection, mediator, and ladder to bridge the gap created by sin between God and men. Jesus Christ would initiate a new spiritual covenant available to all. He would exchange our sins for his righteousness, allowing us to know God and enjoy the intimate relationship he intended from the start. Jesus was indeed the Son of God. Even the Roman soldier at the cross declared that. As Christians, we see this dream of Jacob as highly symbolic, representing the mediator, Jesus Christ, who came to earth and became that ladder or stairway for us to reconnect the relationship with God that was severed because of sin. Number 3. What are the Three Heavens? The Three Heavens When the word heaven is used in the Bible without a symbolic connotation, it most commonly refers to one of three realms. As a consequence of this, we discover that the Bible talks about more than one heaven. The first heaven, the atmospheric heaven. The atmospheric heavens include the air that we breathe and the space that immediately surrounds the earth. The second heaven, the celestial heaven. When the term heaven is used, it refers to outer space, or what is commonly known as the stellar heaven. This encompasses the sun, the moon, and the stars. The third heaven, heaven as the home of God. According to scripture, there is a specific location known as heaven, where God is said to reside. Heaven is called the presence of God. What is your view of heaven? Do you believe that there's a location like this one? If this is the case, is it a place filled with ethereal light and song, where choirs worship God in a breathtakingly beautiful and intricately designed setting? Paul gives us a glimpse. Paul shares his visions and revelations of the Lord. 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 1 and 2. Boasting is necessary, though it is not beneficial. But I will go on to visions and revelations of the Lord. I know a man in Christ who, 14 years ago, whether in the body I do not know or out of the body I do not know, God knows. Such a man was caught up to the third heaven. Paul identifies this third heaven as paradise. The word paradise originates from the Persian word for an enclosed lavish garden, which was often exclusively found on the grounds of royal residences in the ancient world. Paul does not explain anything he saw when discussing this celestial vision, only a shadowy description of what he heard. The reason why Paul was granted this vision was twofold. Firstly, it was for our benefit as people so that we could learn from the Lord's teachings revealed to Paul. Secondly, this vision gave Paul the strength to endure all the hardships in his ministry and empowered him to pass on God's message to future generations. This vision significantly helped Paul complete his mission. Passages such as this one give us the concept often associated with heaven, purity, or holiness. The words spoken in that place are so sacred that they cannot be repeated outside. Paradise is the ultimate destination of all sinners who have genuinely repented and persevered in the life of faith. Ezekiel documents a similar throne scene. As Ezekiel was watching, he noticed a fierce whirlwind coming from the north. 
Soon after, he saw four living creatures with four faces, a lion, an ox, an eagle, and a man, which had four wings, straight feet, and hands under their wings. These creatures symbolize God's attributes in creation, such as his majesty, power, swiftness, and wisdom. If we compare what John saw in the book of Revelation with what Ezekiel saw, we can observe that Ezekiel provides a more detailed description of the four living creatures. Four remarkable beings were notable from within this whirlwind of God's presence. The cherubim are the angels of extraordinary might and glory who surround God, as Ezekiel revealed in Ezekiel chapter 10, verses 8 through 15. Number 4. Who are the 24 elders? In the throne room of God, there is a notable presence a circle of 24 elders, dressed in white robes and crowned with gold, sitting on thrones surrounding the main throne. It begs the question, who are these figures and why are they there? Furthermore, what is the significance of the 24 elders? What is their role in judgment and redemption? And what can their presence teach us about our place in the grand narrative of existence? Dive deep with us into the mysteries of the book of Revelation as we seek to understand the significance of the 24 elders, their role in the heavenly realm, and the final chapters of human history. After addressing the seven churches, suddenly John found himself in the very throne room of God. He saw God seated on a throne there, looking like precious gemstones. Surrounding this throne were 24 other thrones, and on these thrones sat 24 elders. These elders wore white robes with golden crowns on their heads. John has an encounter with 24 elders. If only we could ask an angel who could interpret for us, who are these elders? That would be pretty handy, right? There are at least 13 views of their identity, from the 24 ruling stars, or judges in the heavens, to a more straightforward representation of completeness and comprehensiveness. The elders are always associated with the four living creatures. There are 12 months in a lunar year, 12 tribes of Israel, 12 apostles, 12 gates in the New Jerusalem, 12 angels at each gate, 12 foundations, 12,000 sealed from each tribe, and so on. In the Bible, 12 represents the number of divine governments. There is undoubtedly a connection between the significance of the number 12 and that of its multiples, such as 24 or any other multiple. Thrones are related to the heavenly powers in… The entire scene was one of unimaginable splendor, worship, and adoration. The elders, along with the four living creatures around the throne, fell before God, casting their crowns before him, and declaring, You are worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power. For you created all things, and by your will they exist and were created. Revelation chapter 4, verse 11. In addition, the Greek word that has been translated here as elders is never used to refer to angels. Instead, it is only ever used to refer to men, and more specifically, men of a certain age who have reached maturity and are capable of ruling the church. Angels do not experience the effects of aging, hence we cannot use the term elder to describe them. Although angels can be seen wearing white, white is more frequently associated with believers because it represents the righteousness of Christ ascribed to us at salvation. Revelation chapter 3, verse 5. The one who overcomes will be clothed the same way, in white garments, and I will not erase his name from the book of life and I will confess his name before my father and before his angels. The elders are wearing golden crowns, which is another indication that they are not angels. Angels are never given crowns, and no evidence has ever been found of angels wearing them. The term that is translated here as crown alludes to the victor's crown, which is worn by those who have contended effectively and won the victory, as Christ promised. The bowls that the 24 elders in Revelation 5 are seen to be holding provide another justification for viewing them as representations of the church. The cherubim, the living creatures, serve as a motivation for the 24 elders to engage in worship. Because the cherubim worships God at all hours of the day and night, 
the elders do as well. Elders are seen as representatives of God's people, particularly in the Old Testament. They are adorned with the crowns of victory and have moved on to the location that their Redeemer has prepared for them.